Well, we're a minute past, so I'll get us started. And then as people join, they'll just jump in where they're here. So welcome everybody. This is another learning speaker series that I'm hosting today with Christopher Connors. This uh, discussion is part of a series that I've been hosting this quarter called What is Emotional Intelligence? And Christopher is our third speaker on emotional intelligence. So if you've been to either of the earlier sessions or even if not, really looking forward to getting Christopher's view. And this specific session is called Emotional Intelligence for Modern Leaders. And I think that something I've been thinking of lately is like when we think about leaders, even if you aren't a people manager, you're still a leader in your own role at GitLab. And so I'm excited to have this conversation with the lens of how emotional intelligence shows up in our leadership styles. If you've never been to one of these sessions before, we follow the same format every time. I'm gonna do a quick bio introduction for Christopher in a second. And then Christopher and I will jump into a conversation where I'll ask him three questions <clears throat> you can find already written in the meeting agenda. And then after we go through those three questions, we will open up to a Q&A for team members on the call. So as we're chatting, if you have like a follow-up question or a new question you wanna ask Christopher, feel free to add that to the agenda and we'll get through as many as we can at the end of the call. <clears throat> I think that's all I have. I'm just gonna put an ask out there for everyone to please mute if you aren't muted already or I will mute you here. And great. Okay, so let me read this quick bio for Christopher and then we'll get started. So really excited to have Christopher here. Christopher Connors is the best-selling author of Emotional Intelligence for the Modern Leader and the Value of You. Christopher is a keynote speaker and executive leadership coach who helps leaders increase their emotional intelligence, prioritize results, and build thriving organizations. He works with executives and leaders at Fortune 1000 companies and organizations around the world. Christopher, welcome to GitLab. Thank you so much, Samantha. Thank you for having me. And, and Samantha told me even before, really good turnout expected for today. So uh, that always means a lot to know that there are people willing to show up uh, to, to listen and, and try to get better uh, based on what I have to say. So thank you all for, for being here. I appreciate it. Yeah, great. Thanks for being here, Christopher. Um, okay. So I'll ask this first question and we can chat about it for a little bit. So can you speak a bit about what emotional intelligence or EQ is and how it shows up differently at work, especially in an all remote environment as compared to how it might show up in our relationships outside of work? Sure, I'll start with really the, the textbook definition which was actually uh, about 40 years old. So Dr. Peter Salovey, current president of Yale University and one of his research associates, Dr. John D. Mayer, they coined what I think is the best definition of EQ. It's the ability to recognize, understand, and manage our emotions. And it's the ability to recognize, understand, and then influence the emotions of other people. I'll also speak a little bit here about the what of emotional intelligence by defining it through the original five pillars that uh, Dr. Daniel Goleman first defined it as, which is a lot of what I do my work around. And that's self-awareness, self-management or self-regulation, empathy, motivation, and social skill. So to go back to that definition, uh, it's the ability to recognize, understand, and manage our emotions. So really the recognition and the understanding is, is the self-awareness piece. That, that's that ability, and I'll talk a little bit more about self-awareness, but obviously the manage is the self-management, the self-regulation, how we're both processing uh, our emotions, but how we're adapting to certain situations uh, as well. Really, the second part of it being that influencing piece is where all of the other components of EQ come in. So empathy, motivation, social skill. And a lot of people really, when we think about leadership, I, I also want to point out that you know all of us, no matter our title or position, are in a position to influence. And really, that's what leadership is all about. It's, it's how we're able to influence things uh, in, in a variety of different ways. And so that's a little bit more of the what of emotional intelligence. I do believe that, you know, EQ is a skill set, you know, I think both personally and professionally that is going to show up. I, I like to ask people to think about emotional intelligence uh, through a prism, I call it connecting the cord. So what do I mean by that? 
the C being in terms of how we communicate, the O being the way that we identify and recognize opportunities, the R, how we build relationships, and the D being the decision-making component of it. So all of us are going to have that kind of foundation for that personally, but then it's thinking about and, and finding time even in our weeks and our days strategically to think about, well, how are we showing up that way professionally? Uh, to go back to the to, to really the, the latter part of your question, Samantha, it's, you know, how are some of these things going to show up remotely? And a big thing that I spend a lot of time on from a communication standpoint is the way that we individualize or personalize our relationships. So thinking about all the different channels of communication that we have uh, in a remote environment, we might be using a tool like Slack or email or some kind of instant message function, text, phone, thinking about what each situation dictates with teams, with individuals of how we go about uh, communicating and when we choose to use that to what effect. Um, part of working remotely and thinking even more about emotional intelligence as well, it's, it's the self-care component. And what did we learn a lot from when the pandemic first hit was just the importance of being able to take care of ourselves. So that self-awareness and recognition of maybe going for a walk and taking breaks to avoid burnout um, and, and, and things like that that can come uh, from just the ability to recognize and understand our needs and wants, which is a big part of emotional intelligence. So I want to stop there. I know it's a little bit of a longer answer to start, but just wanted to give a little bit more definition to the what. Uh, and, and I can certainly share a little bit more about uh, the remote aspect of it too. Yeah, I think that that's great because like I, your response made me think of two different things. We talk a lot about avoiding burnout at GitLab yeah. and we have like systems in place in the way that we work that at, at least in my experience at GitLab allow for a lot of um, flexibility in my day. We work with this thing called the... Um, Nonlinear workday. And so rather than saying I sit at my desk from eight to five, I can sit at my desk from eight to 10 and then I go on a walk and then I move things around based on how my day looks. And so I think that that really connects like how GitLab works remotely. But the thing I wanted to follow up on, if you don't mind talking a little bit more about it, is the communications piece. Because earlier this year, we had another speaker come in who talked about understanding and interpreting tone in asynchronous communication, like the examples you were sharing, like Slack. We use mostly Slack and we communicate within GitLab. And then we use email as well, mostly for like external communications. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about how the way that we interpret or assume tone in text might influence like our emotional response to the work. It's a fantastic question. Um, I just come back to, you know, just a simple maxim of, you know, assuming positive intent. And I think this is where we get into the nuance of social skill. But this is this is why I do the work that I do. I, I say, let's let's get our hands dirty. Let's talk about some of these things. You know, there, there could be a situation where someone was late with a deliverable or someone had maybe said something previously that upset us. And our first instinct is to say, I'm going to maybe come with something a little passive aggressive in this Slack response, in this email response. And sometimes it really is as simple as a simple thought. And that simple thought is this. Biggest piece of advice that I give to people in those situations is stop and reflect. Don't just send something. And just because Slack or some level of instant messaging kind of seems to dictate that we just immediately hit send, Sometimes the smartest thing that we can do is actually stop, take a two minute break, get up, come back with a clear pair of eyes. Maybe it's a five minute break, maybe it's a 30 minute break. You get the point. But you know, I, I think part of social skill and, and being a, a savvy communicator is trying to remove any negative emotions when they come up. <laughs> from potentially damaging a relationship. And that's, I think, what we're talking about here. I, I have the privilege, I, I, I get to work in a confidential relationship with one of the biggest technology companies in the world. And I'm coaching people from there every day around, you know, not just the verbal communication, but the written communication. You know, don't, you know, some things that we may in the moment objectively think about and say, well, you know, don't never, you know, throw your teammate under the bus as the expression goes, or don't make someone look bad in front of other people, but don't do it in a one-on-one -on -one setting. 
you know, so much about what emotional intelligence for me is about is empathy, it's social skill. And I think that the art of famous quote with when we think about with empathy, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Is it corny? Yes. <laughs> so one of my favorite quotes because the, the, the message behind it is it's not often as much the point we're trying to make or the what of what we're communicating. It's the how. Mm. It's how we communicate. So to go back to the written form of Slack, or as you said, the asynchronous communication, it's taking a break from the pressures of the day. It could just be one minute, getting up, coming back with a clear mind and a clear perspective, being mindful. Empathy is all about putting ourselves in someone else's shoes. Write it, don't hit send. What would that person think of this? Could they possibly interpret anything negatively from this. I, I want to try to be more neutral tone. I think it's okay to accentuate. So sometimes if you're upset, maybe at a result and you're not upset at an individual, maybe it's okay to try to accentuate that. It's okay to accentuate passion and positive emotions, but in the written form, you know, just something to think about. But otherwise, I, I just try to say relationships are the most important capital in business. We should always be of the mindset of trying to build new ones and nurture existing ones. So what are some of the things that go into that? It's again, assuming positive intent. It's asking someone maybe a little bit about how their day is going or, or just some kind of small talk or, or understanding what their motivating factors are as a human being first. I mean, Samantha and I were talking before we started today uh, just a little bit about how each one of us was doing. And, and, and that's how when we first connected, we were asking those types of things. Just be a good human first, you know, to build a relationship. And that often goes a really, really long way uh, in terms of just having an emotionally intelligent mindset and approach toward communications and relationship building. Yeah. Thanks for that. That's great. I'll share one little thing before I ask this next question, but in a previous call on emotional intelligence, one of our team members, uh, his name is Darren Murph. I'm not sure if he's on the call today, but he had a really great little like sound bite. I think that describes that well. And he said, connection before content. And so like making time, every time you're having a live conversation and probably asynchronous too, connecting to see how people are doing before moving into the work stuff can be really powerful. Absolutely. Great. Well, thanks for that. Um, I'm going to put a plug in to remind people, if you have questions for Christopher, you can add those to the bottom of the agenda, and we'll get uh, to that once we go through these questions. Also, thank you to those who are helping take notes in the agenda. Really appreciate that. Um, okay, so question two. I'm wondering, is there a connection between emotional, emotional intelligence and results? In other words, is it worth leaders' time to think and talk about their own EQ and that of their teams? Absolutely. Uh, to go back to the point that you were just making a uh, connection over time. I like that. I, I like that. Whoever, and that, that, that's a smart and, and, and something very original. And it's true, right? I mean, let me start out by saying this. I have so many thoughts on the subject because this is a lot of the space that I live in every day. Uh, I've had the privilege of doing a lot of uh, 360 degree leadership assessments with managers, executives, directors, leaders, individual contributors over the years. What are two of the most important things that come out? I, I have found resoundingly in almost every one of these things, especially from a leadership standpoint. The most important thing that always comes out is I wish she or he took more time to get to know who I am as a person. I wish they invested more time in getting to know me as not just Samantha or Chris or John or Mary, the employee. But the reciprocal is true. It's not just about, I wish they got to know me. What often we want and we desire in connection in, in certain respects is wanting to get to know more about that other person as well. So a big part of connection and emotional intelligence is the ability to tell stories. I'm gonna give a little bit of an answer. It's not my own research came from a book called Talk Like Ted that was actually written about a lot of the most famous TED Talks of all time, of, of all things. The reason I'm telling you this is for this reason. 
what they found, what researchers found in going through all of this data from very, very famous, you know, orators and communicators throughout history of, of, of these TED Talks was that over two thirds, over two thirds of the way that they tried communicating with their audience was through emotion. So we think of, this is from Aristotle of ethos, logos, and pathos. And there's a point to be made here, the ethos piece uh, being, you know, we might talk about our credentials in the same way, Samantha, that you introduced me at the beginning of our time together. We might talk about the things that we've accomplished or what we've done. The logos is using data and statistics and information to make a point, which I'm going to do shortly here. But the, but the pathos part of it is the emotional connection. Mm. Six, almost two thirds, two thirds of the way. And, and I believe, and I've you know, found this in the work that I do with organizations over and over again. We walk away from a lot of interactions. We may not always remember every statistic, or we may not always remember that individual's credentials, but we do remember the way they made us feel, the emotions that we experienced in those interactions, the power of storytelling, the power of getting to know someone. And so on face level, in a lot of instances, we, we may sometimes think, well, what that that doesn't necessarily have to do with the results that we're looking to drive or how we're necessarily trying to innovate uh, technologically. But those are the ingredients that build camaraderie and, and bring people together. The other point, a study that was done over 15 years ago, they did a study that this organization called Talent Smart did a study of 33 workplace skills. And out of all of the skills that they surveyed, the number one skill for enduring long-term success in the workplace was emotional intelligence. 58% you know, of respondents said that, and it ended up being the number one choice. So what, what I'm always keen to say is intelligence, IQ is what's going to get your butt in the seat. It's all of the things that come back from an EQ standpoint, the pillars, the way we communicate, opportunities, relationships, decision-making. It's those things that enable us to really take it to the next level and endure in terms of our own career mobility, our own ability to just drive results and, and, and be effective in the role that we're in for the long term. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. We have, I can try to find the where this is in the handbook, but at GitLab, we our values, we use an acronym credit. And um we have like a hierarchy of those values. And the reason I asked this question is that results is like at the results is the R and credit, but it's at the top of the hierarchy of our um, values. And what it kind of sounds like to me, what you're saying is like, I see, I see emotional intelligence really connect to our values of collaboration and also diversity, inclusion, and belonging, which come underneath results. But I don't know, it's like probably kind of cheesy, but, you know, support results and results wouldn't happen if those two values weren't underneath results. And I'm just trying to relate it to what you said about how like your IQ or like your past results and skills is what gets you like the job, your butt in seat, I think is what you said, but then it's your ability to perform at those other important values that as a whole organization helps us achieve results at an organization level. That's exactly right. And, and, and I love the values that you listed. I'm someone I've read, my first book is all about core values. And I think that, you know, that, that, that is what builds the culture and would encourage everybody to come back. I mean, I, I, part of the genesis of why I even wrote my first book, I, I worked, I started my business career after graduate school in, in the management consulting sector. And, and I worked at a firm, you know, top, firm that, you know, we were literally evaluated and assessed on our adherence to the core values of the company, but it all, it made us all better. Things like teamwork, integrity, loyalty, client service, you know, things of that nature. But, you know, the more that we as individuals buy in to, uh, you know, the vision, the mission, the values, but that it, it's, you know, we're getting time with leaders, with other individuals to espouse those values. I mean, I, I think, you know, Another thing that has jumped out actually in conversation, we, we talked about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, another piece of inclusion that I think is important to add that, that sometimes goes overlooked is inclusivity of ideas. Mm -hmm. What an emotionally intelligent leader does is she or he brings 
every stakeholder to the table, every organization, no matter how big or small, whether we're mostly co-located or whether we're remote in, in all different parts of the world, every organization is only as good as the inclusivity of ideas that come from the bottom up as well as the top down. A very important distinction, innovation is born from inclusivity of ideas, right? So the, the, the way that I, I, when I think of it in this context is going back to my little connect the cord analogy, use the O as an opportunity, feel empowered to speak up and share ways that you can make the company better and you can make the people around you better. Having an opportunistic mindset, I believe, is, is what emotionally intelligent people do. It, it, it goes back to all the other things of how we interact and connect. But to your point, I love what you said. It's not just about the results. The culture enables and creates the results. I think to go back to your original question, it's the reason why so many organizations harp on the importance of having a great culture. Great culture builds camaraderie, builds great teams, brings people together, increases motivation. So as we think about how does that pertain to all of you? You know, think about the impact and never underestimate the impact that you can have on all the other people that you relate to. Have a, you know, a, a, a them seeking mindset, put their needs before your own, kind of like a servant leadership type of approach, which correlates a lot back to EQ. But you know, that, that empathy piece of caring about others, putting yourself in their shoes, doing benefit, you know, doing good for the benefit of others, you know, having that mindset from a people standpoint uh, is a real unifying thread. Yeah. Great. Thanks for that, Christopher. Um, okay, I'll go on to this last question, and then we'll move on to the team member questions. Um, okay, so this one is that being vulnerable can be hard, especially for leaders who feel like speaking about their own EQ is hard. Can you share some strategies for developing a greater self-awareness of how our emotional intelligence influences the way we work? Sure. Yeah. And, and coming back here to EQ. So I the, the really top three things. Number one, uh, I will begin with the self-work component of it, if you will. So it is how we know our own strengths and skills. It's how we, you know, again, recognize and understand the way that we're feeling. Understanding, and, and I make an important point to say, it, emotions are not good and bad. They're, they're positive and negative is, I think, one way to look at all of the different ways that we encounter the feelings that we do. Uh, knowing how to then manage, again, going back to the example of maybe someone upset us, maybe there was something that happened in a previous meeting that we don't want to necessarily carry over. Uh, and, and, and again, tone can be interpreted for me. We're able to kind of stop ourselves and recognize those emotions. But you know, I, I go back and I want to give, want to be able to give a couple of tools that I use a lot with organizations that I work with. So again, three things with self-awareness, but we're staying in the lane right now for skills, strengths, knowing thyself, if you will, understanding and recognizing the stimuli we face. But one way to build self-awareness is, is um, I, I recommend this. It's an assessment. It's called Strengths Finder. Some of you may already be familiar with it or have maybe taken it. Um, and, and I get nothing from this, I assure you. <laughs> I don't get a penny from Clifton or anything, but it, it's a tool that I use a lot in my coaching. Uh, the more that we know the things that we do really, really well, like there's, there's just a, a, a wealth of literature out there around uh, of academic and scientific research around the importance of accentuating and knowing our strengths, leaning into the things that we do really, really well every day. So the more we know what we're really, really good at and talented at personally and professionally um, really, really helps us. But the second part of self-awareness comes from feedback, which is often why we hear so much about the importance of having you know, conversations with managers, with our peers, with some of our direct reports. But feedback is often what leads to the biggest breakthroughs in our own self-awareness. Some of that's gonna naturally be built into review cycles and assessments. But from an emotional intelligence standpoint of increasing self-awareness, I always encourage the people that I work with to proactively, if it's not being offered, proactively seek out feedback. Be willing to have the quote unquote tough or challenging conversations, which by the way, are tough and challenging. Let's, let's not kid ourselves, right? 
those are not easy conversations in certain respects to learn what we need to do to improve or what we could do to get better. Hopefully we have an empathetic manager, peer, friend that can kind of level with us and be real with us. But those are the most powerful growth moments because they lead to the greatest recognition and understanding of our own um, self-awareness. The last thing, and I can go into a little bit more of the how-to on this with all of you, and I, and I wanna be able to do that. But the third thing is really, it's how we perceive others to see us. So how do we achieve that? It's kind of recognition in the moment. It's being able in the moment to read the room, if you will, or to take pauses and reflect. Some of the times that's, that's challenging in a one-on-one -on -one fast paced type of conversation. We may not always have as much ability right in the second to do it, but maybe after we've finished speaking and the listening piece, right? So when we talk about communication, I mean, really for me, communications begins with listening. So being able to, to actually hear uh, and, and, and you know, what other people are saying verbally, but to pick up on their body language, to perceive how others are receiving us, having time for reflection, having time for journaling, having thought time, having what I call strategy time in our week, building in maybe five or 10 minutes a day to just reflect on how we perceive others have received us, how something went. So to go back for self-awareness, it's really knowing ourselves, our strengths, our skills, all the stimuli we're facing. It's getting feedback, uh, but it's, it's perceiving how others uh, often receive us. Great. Yeah, thanks for going into that, Christopher. I'm gonna move us on to the team member questions because we have a few that are coming through the document. So I'll ask team members if they're here to come off mute and voice the question. Conley, I'm not sure if you're still here. Hey, yeah, hopefully you can hear me okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome, let me uh, verbalize real quick. Thanks, Christopher, for taking the time today. Um, this is sort of a GitLab specific thing, but I'm gonna try to generalize it and get your take on it. We, we have our handbook that tells everything about sort of our culture, a lot about our company and Whenever we're trying to remind our colleagues of specific, you know, cultural uh, elements or values that we are seeing not carried out or could be done better, um, or if it's just sending somebody a link on a process, we we call that getting handbooked and or like sending somebody a handbook link. Um, and sometimes it can just come across as sort of off-putting or in a corrective tone, especially over Slack, um, and not you know you don't get the yeah, the, the tone of the voice and, and everything that comes with that. So I was just curious how, you know, we can achieve that outcome, you know, when we do see inconsistencies with our values without coming across as negative or behavior correcting communication. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I think about my, my short answer, long answer, the short answer is just go the extra mile. So I, I can see, I can perceive how it could be perceived by some, maybe as off-putting if the instant response is, here's the link to the handbook, because there's not really a lot of handling, if you will, with that response. And so what do I mean when I say go the extra mile? I, I think prefacing our response by acknowledging context, acknowledge context, explain the purpose. So Simon Sinek, very famous, wrote a book called, uh, you're, you're, you're talking about the why, so why are we doing what we're doing? The purpose behind it. So context, purpose, but put a personalized touch on it. And this is what I, I, I didn't quite get into as much depth about, but is often what I'm speaking about these days is I talk about a strength called individualization. That is informed by all of the data points that we gather from interacting with someone. Now, Conley, in, in the case of you and I, right, the second is the first time I'm ever seeing you and meeting you, right? But in, in a different life, maybe, or in a different you know, future, if, if you and I had already interacted on several different occasions, I'm now informed consciously and subconsciously by all of the different communications, interactions, the relationship building time that we've had together, where I'm going to try to personalize the way that I communicate with you in response. So thinking about the way we want someone else to feel for having interacted with us. Last thing I'll say on that, I'm not blind to the fact that all of this is balanced out by what? Time. 
And time is often our biggest obstacle. So we may think, and, and maybe some are, are thinking as I, as I say that, well, I, things are moving so fast, we don't have the time. I might think about just an extra, you know, the extra mile could just be 15 seconds. Context and purpose, you type that up kind of quickly, but you wrap it with, if this doesn't make sense, you're welcome to reach out to me and let's connect and talk about it a little bit more. I'm trying to help you. Know, I, I want to be able to help you out here. And so I think that I go back to that assuming positive intent. I think if somebody knows that we've gone the extra mile, we've tried to individualize that communication, even if it's over Slack, and that they can see that we're genuinely trying to help and we're offering that help in, in actual written form, it might take an extra 15 or 20 seconds. But that's the difference, I think, between thinking short term and long term. Long term, that might just preserve or build a relationship. So a little bit of a longer response, but I think context and purpose matter tremendously and that you're always thinking, how am I trying to help this individual and how might I put myself in their shoes before I hit send on that Slack message? Yeah, Conley had to drop off to join another call, but I think that that, like what you just said about context being important and also seeing it as like an opportunity to build a relationship there's like that opportunity again and seeing how you can support this other person. And then I also think that there's like the flip side to it all is that, and I think it was maybe Sean in the chat, there's like a, you know, adjacent conversation going on. Sean, do you want to add something? Yeah, I was going to say that's the, exactly the extra mile. I feel like if you're going to go find the link and send it to someone, you can go that extra two minutes and just say, hey, I found this link. This is how it helped me. I wanted to share it with you. If someone just sends me a link, I appreciate it, but I don't know what the context is. And so to your point about assuming positive intent, a lot of your emotions can be like, thank you, but I wish you would have helped me because you're stressed, you're, you know, you have all these feelings. Just that one sentence can help me where now I know to reach out to you and say, hey, thank you very much. And then you don't, you remove all that frustration immediately, at least for me. Yeah. And I think it's different too, depending on who you're chatting with. Because like, I work really closely, closely with JC on my team. I don't add context to when I send her a, a handbook link. I just send it to her and she knows exactly what I'm talking about. But say I'm talking to someone who's like brand new at GitLab and it's like the first time I've ever messaged with them. They might see a link and just be like, Samantha doesn't want anything to do with me. She just wants me to go read and totally figure this out on my own. So I think it depends on, and that kind of takes some work. You have to like find out how long this person's been here, right? You, like that maybe going the extra mile isn't, adding fluff to your Slack message, but it's like checking their Slack profile and saying, did they just join GitLab yesterday or have they been here for a year, right? They have more context just having been here to know what a handbook link means. You're exactly right. I, I think that the tenure matters tremendously, but the other, and the other thing just to, to, you know, the relationship, you know, you may all, you already have that relationship with JC. You may not have it with Maria. And that's where I, you know, so yes, I, I think we're all on the same page, but it's it, two great points there. Tenure, time at, at, at the company, but also do I have this relationship? Do I not have this relationship? And kind of taking that into account uh, in, in terms of how we communicate. Yeah, great. Thanks. Conley's not on, but I appreciate this question. Really great to apply this to something that happens all the time at GitLab. So thanks for that. Catherine has the next question. Catherine, are you on? I'm on. Cool. Hi, Christopher. Hi, Samantha. Um, I find this topic fascinating. So thank you for being here. Um, my question is, can you speak a little bit to how boundaries tie into emotional intelligence? Um, because I think that when we have a high level of empathy, which a lot of Git lovers do, um, and then we're also super highly results oriented, it can be a hard thing. So would like to hear your thoughts. Well, let me, let me actually, if you don't mind, let me ask, I, I want to make this as real as possible. Do you, do you mind, would it be possible for you to offer a little bit more context here to, to what could be a, a, a situation where you've either encountered or, or if that's okay? Um, so a situation for me would have been something where uh, deadlines are coming, they're really heavy, not all the team has the same flexibility as others. And so then you feel pressured to take on more, if that makes sense. 
Sure, sure. Uh, no, and it's let me let me think about this because in right this second. So I mean, so when you say boundaries, I, I, I guess I think of it conventionally in terms of just our roles and responsibilities that we might have in that situation, and that some people may feel that they need to take on more in a, in a certain situation. Um, you know, I, I guess I, I don't know if this is perfect. Where my mind is going right now in the moment is just thinking of maybe in that situation, acknowledging the situation. You know, that, that kind of takes self-awareness to kind of acknowledge a situation for what it is and maybe hit the reset around, you know, what the roles and responsibilities could come in that situation, given someone's work responsibilities uh, or, or one team member's work responsibilities over another. And so I think, um, again, I, I'm happy to kind of expand on this a little bit more. For now, I just wanted to point out, I mean, one of the most important leadership lessons that I learned in the workforce was, used to have a leader who always used to say, and what's the most important thing a leader can do is provide clarity. And so I think sometimes just calling and recognizing and understanding a situation for what it is, clearly communicating that uh, to others. And, and maybe even if you're going to take action in that situation, uh, just announce it, you know, call it for what it is, but maybe reassess in a similar situation. I, I hope that that helps. It was just my take on it in the moment. Yeah, that is helpful. A lot of times it is just taking a moment, <laughs> stepping back and acknowledging like and talking through something instead of just like rushing to the next thing. So that does help. Yes. I think it's seeing the big picture, right? We get, you know, and I, 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 I feel I could go in other directions with what you presented. I mean, that again, maybe if you're constantly operating under that environment, it leads to burnout, it leads to stress, it leads to why are certain people seemingly taking on responsibility a lot more frequently perhaps than others. But I think the more, you know, bandwidth can be communicated, the more these things are raised to the surface level and that they are, you know, the importance that the, the conversation, I think there's a famous, I think it's George Bernard Shaw, famous quote, you know, that biggest problem in communication is sometimes assuming that the conversation has taken place. And so, you know, I, again, I think from a self-awareness standpoint for the success of teams, you can never communicate enough up front to make sure that everybody does have role clarity in specific situations and that that is reassessed so that certain people aren't being stretched too far. I mean, that is ultimately, I think, an empathetic understanding of things. It's, it's recognizing what each person is maybe going through at each juncture. So um, further thought on that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Um, okay, we got two more questions in the doc, and I think we'll have time to cover both of them. Uh, this next one is from Cindy, who asked me to voice it because they're in a loud coffee shop right now. So Cindy's question is, what's the best way to request feedback from a manager or a coworker? Best way to reflect that? Well, and, and so let me, let's go to the tools, right? To go back to where we were before. Part of it, is I think a little bit mixed in with your comfort level, but I think just being direct. Let me answer this by going through what I often use as a formula, kind of like a success formula, if you will, in some of the coaching work that I do. I talk about you know directness plus candor plus empathy plus authenticity equals victory. So being direct and just saying, I, you know, Jennifer. I would love to get your feedback on my performance on the recent project. Would you be willing uh, to connect at some point over the next two weeks? So in the line of work that I'm in as a coach, I'm very accustomed, my, you know, a lot of my leadership style as a coach is a coaching style of leadership. I'm, I'm accustomed to asking open-ended questions. And, and I think that in a situation like getting feedback, the answer could be as simple as just be direct, be authentic, be candid, you know, express the initiative to want the feedback and, and, and have the courage to make the ask and to be direct. And, and so I, I think that, you know, great managers are going to know that someone willing to take the initiative to ask for feedback is someone self-motivated that's interested in driving uh, their, their own success and their own career. Uh, and part of getting better is asking for feedback, knowing and having the confidence and self-assuredness to know that that's a common conversation. So I think being direct, asking an open-ended question, trying to make yourself available 
to that, you know, you're asking someone to give you their time, making yourself available for it in the medium that is mutually agreed upon that would be best for each of you. Yeah, that's really great. I added a note too that I like how that example that you said is like specific. So you're not just saying, can I have feedback on my performance? You said, can I have feedback on my performance on project X? And it was also like time bound. You said, would you be willing to give this in the next two weeks or, you know, whatever during our next one-on-one? I think that that like sets some boundaries around the ask and makes it easier for someone to respond because they know exactly what you're looking for and when you're looking for it. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, we have one more question from Nima. Nima, are you still here? I'm still here. <clears throat> so uh, for the international audience, uh, I know that half of our team members don't sp uh, or speak a, a language other than English at home um, and are actually internationally based. And a lot of our uh, idioms and idiosyncrasies and cultural norms don't necessarily translate really well. How can we help each other be more empathetic across some of the virtual tools that we use and then the real language barriers that we do face on a daily basis? I think, it, you know, in the moment here, my answer to that question is to perhaps have the humility as, as individuals, especially if we're in a situation where we may not understand some of the nuances of somebody's culture that we humbly ask to uh, get to know that a little bit better, right? That we may want to learn. To, I, I work on a daily basis with people from all over the world. And when situations dictate it, I show a great interest in wanting to learn more about some of those nuances. Um, it, it's also, I, I think you're quite, it's a great question. It's also a challenging one. There's sometimes that we, we may not, given the pace of things, recognize in the moment that we actually would benefit, we personally may benefit from knowing more of that information, but we'd be making someone else feel better by going into that. And so, you know, I, I talk about, let me answer, let me answer this in a little bit of a, a, another way too. I talk about this all the time in, in, in my coaching conversations. There's different ways that we can ascertain or try to get help. I might say to you at the end of this call or something, I might say, you know, hey guys, if there's anything I can help you with, reach out. Or if I can help you in any way, just let me know. But to go back to Samantha's point from just two or three minutes ago, what about when we can specifically do that? Hey, I know you just asked me earlier um, about the Project X and Project Y, and I know we've been working on that for the last three weeks. You know, I, I, I was in this situation four months ago where the biggest trouble spot that we had was X. If you find yourself in that situation, reach out to me because I can actually connect you. So think about that. When we're maybe more informed, which comes from relationship building, which comes from individualization and how we connect with someone, I think that that applies both in terms of results that we're driving, innovation, uh, interpersonal react, uh, inter relationships that we have. We're always trying to gather data points. We're always trying to pick up new information about someone in an effort to improve that relationship and help them. So you know, we might be able to harken back to previous conversations or previous experiences that we've had. And if we're in a position to offer help, instead of just generically saying, yeah, you know, let me know if I could help you a little bit more with that. I didn't understand what you said. We might be more specifically informed to say, you know, I noticed this. Would you like to be able to explain that to me a little bit more? I'm here to listen. You know, I think specifically being willing to go deeper, kind of going back to before the extra mile, being willing to go deeper when we see that someone might be struggling and being sensitive to that in how we recognize it. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. And, and I just, on a total side tangent, sidebar, I, mean, I actually did a lot of work earlier in my career um, setting up uh, orientation and onboarding programs for inter, you know, at the time being here in the US, international based staff from different regions of the world. And I think that, you know, one thing that is part of, I believe, the inclusivity piece of when we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion is, you know, having a curiosity having a desire to want to learn more about someone's culture, to want to learn more about who they are and where they're from, it's going to help us to relate to them. But frankly, it's just cool. It's just fun, I think. It's, it's fun to learn more about uh, individuals from, from, where, from where they're from and just to get to know them better. Okay. 
Yeah, thanks, Christopher. Cool to see this conversation kind of like wrap back up with building trust uh, between team members because it feels like that's like such an underlying theme with emotional intelligence. Um, we're just a minute over time. So I just wanted to say thank you, Christopher, for being here and chatting with our GitLab team. And thanks to everyone who took time out of your very busy end of quarter week to come and join this conversation. It's been really great to learn from you all. Um, and I appreciate you all being here. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate the time with all of you. Great. All right. Talk to you all later. Have a good day.